Just a bit of background about myself. So my name is John Fitchett. I'm the, um, I'm the managing director at uh, eBizMarts. My background is actually in payments. Um, I've been in payments for about 13 years now. I've worked for a variety of different payment gateways. Um, some of you might know, some of you might not. Um, I've worked at PayPal on their wallet, and I've also worked at Visa as well on their wallet, uh, which was called V.me, which actually did very well in the Polish market, but unfortunately they closed it down and uh, replaced it with a, another proposition called Visa Checkout. And my, my time in PayPal, actually, I, I work quite closely with the Magento community. And this is back in 2007 when we were looking at the, the very early beta versions of Magento. So uh, I know that Mitch in his, in his presentation mentioned about the ease of PayPal integration uh, with Magento. And I hold my hand up and I, I claim responsibility for that because I work quite closely with Magento to get that done. And um, uh, two years ago, I actually left the corporate world and I joined eBizMarts. Uh, about eBizMart, so eBizMarts are uh, effectively a startup. We're 10 years old, but we're, we, we still see ourselves very much as a, a startup. Um, we are, are known within the community for actually building modules and being a, this select technology partner. We've got two modules in the marketplace which are quite widely used. One is um, with the official developer for a, a payment gateway in the UK called SagePay. So you probably saw the link between my past working experience and, and this module and eBizMarts. And we're also the official module developer for a, a company called MailChimp, which is an email marketing extension. And between those two modules, we've, we've, we think we've got about 30 to 40,000 customers using those modules, which is, which is pretty good going. And about four years ago, we looked at, okay, well, what that next product would be for uh, the Magento community. What would we build next? Would we actually partner with a third-party company and build their product, or would we actually build our own product? And we went down the route of actually building our own point-of-sale um, solution for Magento. And what I, what I want to do during this presentation is very much give you some overview and insight as to what we're seeing um, working with retailers from a, uh, an in-store point of view um, to hopefully give you some ideas about what you could do from, from your own perspective. So just very quickly then as a, as a quick show of hands, um, if you're a retailer, if you wouldn't mind just holding your, your hand up and then, and then keep your hands up if you've got a, uh, an online, uh, sorry, a, an in-store, a physical uh, presence as well. And, and for those that don't have a physical presence, who's then looking to have a, a physical presence, whether it be a pop-up shop or a um, go to conferences, exhibitions, etc. Okay, cool. Um, so I'll start with the bad news. Um, <laughs> if, if you read the news, uh, the whole world's going to be uh, in World War Three anytime soon. Um, the US is going to nuke North Korea. And North Korea are going to retaliate, and as a result, none of this really matters anyway. But um, uh, we're, we're inundated, really, from a, a news perspective about this retail apocalypse. You know, stores closing down all the time. Um, you know, the, 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 I suppose the, the physical environment is diminishing, and, and more and more customers are actually going online. Uh, and the recent stats are that by the end of this year, more than 8,000 stores in the U.S. are going to actually close their, their fronts. Um, which is which is which is bad news, um, but it's not all bad actually because what the what the what the news don't cover is the fact that actually three thousand stores are going to be opened in the U.S. So you know it's not all bad news, and when you look at why these stores are closed closing, you know it's not hard to understand why when you look at their business models and, and the fact that a lot of these retailers are carrying a significant amount of debt. We can't talk about retail without talking about. Our friends at Amazon, um, and, and this this slide is, is is quite amazing actually. If we look at uh, the market value of of Amazon, and if you compare it to the next eight competitors in the Amazon space, the market valuation of of Amazon is is greater than the eight combined. And you think, well, that's incredible. Amazon are doing a fantastic job, and it hasn't come out on the slide too well. Um, but if you look at the ten year uh, market valuation from 2006 to 2016, uh, Amazon have grown 2,000% and the rest are all in decline, which is phenomenal. But if you actually match that up with the, the profits, the net profits of Amazon themselves, that was Walmart last year, nearly $15 billion. 
that figure, 2.5 billion, is actually Amazon's total net profits in the last 21 years. And that is phenomenal. If you consider their market cap is nearly 360 billion, and in the last 21 years they've only made net profits of 2.5, you think, what the hell's going on? But actually, and I can talk from a, from a small business point of view, market analysts and actually uh, investors looking to invest their money into, into businesses, they're not actually bothered about the, the net profits of a company. They're actually more interested in the fact that, oh, okay, you're making losses, you're reinvesting your money, um, and your, your anticipated growth over the next five years is going to be huge. And as you can see, okay, this stat is, is quite old, but their growth rate is, is on an upward curve, an upward trajectory, and that, that is continuing. Um, and that's quite worrying. I mean, from, a, from my perspective and from any Bismarck's perspective, we're very much in the realm of, okay, we generate revenues and we, a portion of that is then attributed to profits. Um, and that, uh, we have a sustained growth. But as I mentioned, you know, investors are not looking for that, that sustained growth. They want to see accelerated growth and they don't care about those profits, which is, it doesn't sit too easy with me because it's then you, you're running into a very dangerous model of, okay, if everything goes bad, everything crashes and collapses and then you do end up in that apocalypse that we talked about. Um, so we talk about e-com, um, but we don't really talk about in-store too much. Uh, and we always talk about actually, you know, e-com is, is growing, it's, it's rapidly growing, people are moving more onto that online space as a consumer and, and purchasing more. Um, and they're right. And, and if you look at the stats on the left hand side here, um, you know, online growth is, is continuing in a double digit arena and it's continuing to do so. And by 2020, uh, total e-com retail sales online are expected to top four trillion. But if you put that into comparison with actually total retail sales combined, including our in-store, um, they're dwarfed. And as you can see, 90% of retail still actually occurs on the high street. And that's why the high street is still an important factor, regardless of what the news is telling you about this apocalypse that's happening. And as a result, what we're seeing now is these pure plays, these, these retailers that have started off online have grown quite significantly, are now looking to actually, how can we move to the uh, in-store space? And as, as David mentioned in his presentation earlier, Amazon have, have already started this with their store in Seattle. And as you can see on the billboard there, it just says, just walk out shopping. You walk in, you pick your stuff up, you walk out. There's frictionless, it's, there's no payment. It's all done behind the scenes. Warby Parker, very similar. Um, optical specialists, uh, very much online, done the same thing. They've gone into uh, the storefront. And from a UK perspective, we're, we've got this customer called Misguided, which, again, a fashion retailer, um, runaway success online, uh, and have started to actually open up stores as well. So they're seeing the value in actually moving from the online space into the physical uh, arena. And I suppose you have to question why. If they've got this huge brand asset which is online and they're continuing to grow, you know, what's that next thing that they're looking for to actually expand into? What, why do they want to actually go into that physical arena? Um, I'm not going to go through everyone, everything line by line. I'm sure you can uh, read for yourselves. But uh, Mitch actually said in his presentation as well, you know, you, you, you're then appealing to a different set of customers, which is then increasing your brand awareness within the, the consumer market. Um, you're changing that in-store proposition as well. That store is not bec just bec uh, becoming that order process. It's very much becoming a clienteling point of sale as well. So it changes the store associate's job role. Um, doesn't sit too well for the store associate because they're having to do more work, but from a technology provider such as eBizmarts, we're providing the tools for that customer, for that store associate to have more power at hand. Now, if you can imagine, you know, if I, if I asked everyone who doesn't have a smartphone, you know, there would be no hands that are shown. Everyone's got one of these in their pocket. And if you think about the fact that you've got that much power in your hand, you're not going to be going into store and then asking that, that store associate for information about a product uh, and expect them to have less knowledge than you have. You expect that store associate to be well empowered um, about what they are selling. 
So, I'm sorry, these, these numbers haven't come out correctly. This is actually um, some data and some stats that we've got from uh, a customer of ours, actually, that have deployed a, a client-telling solution um, in store. So the customer is Mothercare. Uh, you might not be familiar with the, with the brand as such, but they are a, they're a leading uh, retailer in the sort of child and baby uh, space. And uh, if, you look at, if you look at what they had before, they, they had an online presence, they had a physical presence as well, but they weren't really matching up the two. So a consumer's walking into store, um, you know, if, they, if you could imagine, if, you, if you're buying a pram, prams nowadays, it's not just a pram, it's a pram in different sizes, different colours, different accessories. Uh, and for a retailer like Mothercare, their warehouse space at the back is very minimal. So they haven't got the ability to actually carry the full catalogue in store. So with the client telling solution, not only have they got the ability to actually talk that customer through all the different options that, the, that they have for that product, but they've actually got the ability then to create the order. I, I won't, I'll, I'll caveat these stats up, because December shows a fantastic result and I'll talk about that in a minute, but prior to December, when we actually launched and, and put this into store, um, I suppose there was an expectation from, from the business, from mother care and from our perspective that this would just be a runaway success straight away. But, but the reality of it was that, you know, we, we gave the, the store associates an iPad with the ability to view their full product and catalogue uh, on the iPad, but actually what these store associates did was they got the iPad and they went, oh, that's fantastic, that's lovely. They put it in the drawer. And then two weeks later, you go back, the iPad's not to be seen, it's discharged, there's no battery on it, and it hasn't been used. And, and the, you know, the, what we missed, the trick that we missed with this was actually getting that store associate engagement from day one. So we spent a lot of time, we spent the last, um, we spent the last three months of uh, 2016 actually working very closely with that store associate to bring them up to speed um, and get them actually empowered with what this device could actually do for their business. And what we saw, by the time we got to uh, December 2016, we saw that um, if you take e-com sales, uh, e-com orders as a whole, 75% of the e-com orders that were generated on Magento were actually generated from the, the client telling device that we deployed in store. And if you look at January 2017, when they, they also had some sales going on, we saw that Ecom, ecom sales uh, as a year-on-year -year figure are actually 0.2% down year-on-year. -year. But if you include the, the point of sale or the client telling sales that occurred in store, revenue was actually up 50%. So that was a huge increase on, on last year's revenue and actually was the, 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 the barometer really for actually pushing this out into the other markets that um, Mothercare wanted to uh, push through all their franchise opportunities. As it stands today, um, in July, uh, these stats are from July actually, um, we're seeing that clienteling orders that are occurring in store now represent 40% of all digital orders that Mothercare is seeing. So you can see the power of what that clienteling solution has done for this particular retailer. So really what's, what's driving this um, retail change and we can really put it into two buckets. We can say that the, uh, there's, there's customer demand and customer uh, change in terms of what they're doing. As I mentioned, they've got their smartphones in their pockets and they're more empowered about their shopping behavior and, and how they go about making their purchase, um, purchases. Um, and also from a technology standpoint as well, what, what's happening in store is, is changing quite, quite massively. Um, the customer behavior, as I mentioned, and these stats are, are pulled from, from WorldPay. They had a report that went out earlier this year, that 80% of smartphone shoppers use their mobile in-store to help with their shopping. So they're actually in the store, they're researching their product on their phone, and they're making a decision there and then whether to buy or actually whether they can find it cheaper and go and shop elsewhere. If that customer had an interaction with the store associate at that point to actually empower them to make that purchase there, it changes the behavior of the consumer in-store. And then we talk about um, point of sale, which is very close to, to my heart in, in terms of, of what we do as a, as a company. Um, and, and what we tend to find is that actually traditional point of sale solutions are very much siloed. And we can go back about, if we take a, a leap back in time, about 40 years, if, if you're 
old enough to, to go back that far. Um, we can very much detail this down into actually uh, computers and, and networking and the cost and availability of, of such products back then. Very expensive, networks were very uh, costly and uh, the management of them were very complex. And, and as a result, point of sale solutions that, that went into store were very much siloed. They were, and at very best, they were, they were networked on a local LAN. So they didn't have communication to outside systems to actually um, create a, a full omni-channel solution. Um, and during that time, um, you know, we get to the, uh, the late 90s and the early 2000s where the internet takes off, commerce takes off, the dot-com bubble starts. And retailers then focus their attention onto e-commerce. And that's where all the attention has been uh, for the last 15 years or so. You know, it's all about, okay, well, how can we drive more customers online, purchase online, and keep that, you know, keep that growth happening online. And, and as a result, the, the POS development has very much stagnated. And no one's really thought of that and until, you know, the last sort of four or five years when people have started, re retailers started to realize that actually there's a, there's a lot to gain from actually developing the in-store point of sale at the same time. And if we look at, um, I know David, you mentioned in your presentation about don't like the word disruptor, if I had to throw it up there. Um, you know, you look at the sort of market as we, as we are from a point of sale perspective. You've got your, your standalone typical legacy systems, your NCRs, uh, Fujitsu systems, the Windows-based systems that take a decade to boot up. Uh, when they crash, you know, it's the same thing, let's try and restart it. Um, and we've moved to this, this realm of, of the EMPOS. Um, and we've seen these companies like Lightspeed and Revel um, and, and Vend as well, as well sort of really take hold of the market and really drive this tablet-based point-of-sale solution out to the market. Uh, and in actual fact, Revel have done a, a fantastic job to, to highlight the, the proliferance of this because in, in Q1, in Apple's Q1 zoning report um, earlier this year, they mentioned the fact that Revel are one of the biggest Apple-based or iPad-based point-of-sale solution providers in the market with about 20,000 deployments. And that's fantastic from a company that's less than 10 years old. They've gained, gained a great market share um, from having a, a new and unique solution. However, the, the caveat with this is that from a retailer's perspective, you're still into that realm of having a, a siloed, even though albeit a, a brand new technology point of sale, it's still a siloed point of sale solution. So you as a retailer have still got to upload all of your products, all of your inventory, all of your pictures, your descriptions, your pricing, your promotions into a separate system, which is different from your e-commerce site. And you've got to manage that separately. Now, there are links or, or modules that can connect these up with your e-commerce platforms, but typically those links aren't complete and they don't really take the full power of each system and combine them together. So what you see is the, the, the advent of these uh, e-commerce based point of sale solutions. Um, Salesforce or Demand, whereas it was, uh, acquired a company called Tomax point of sale. Uh, an Oracle purchased, or it's ATG isn't it, uh, Oracle ATG purchased uh, Micros. And what they're trying to do is they're trying to merge these two worlds together to provide one single unified channel commerce solution. If anyone's worked in a, in a large corporate, they know that when an acquisition occurs, they've got the great vision and, and uh, uh, opportunity to bring those two systems together to create uh, a fantastic solution. Uh, the reality of it is, is that it never really happens like that, unfortunately. Um, but it's, it's, a, it's a space to watch because as time goes on, as, as they start to work more internally uh, and they realize what the customers want or the retailers want, they will adapt and, and enhance these solutions. Um, <laughs> there's, no, there's no real affiliation here between uh, the mattress uh, discussion that, that David had. I've got no, no shares or affiliations with, uh, with Silent Night. <laughs> Um, although I think we should have a discussion afterwards about a potential business opportunity. Um, but this is a, a customer that, that I've, I've been to see, Silent Night. Um, and as you can see on their, on their shop front, they haven't called it a shop. Or they haven't, they haven't taken, the, what, I suppose what they've done is they've called it a showroom, just like what, what Made.com did. It's their showroom. It's not a shop. 
Um, and they've completely designed it to, to be a more inviting arena for that customer to come in, that consumer to come in to, to test out their products. They're not, they're not selling anything from there. They're not expecting anyone to actually walk out with a, uh, a super king bed uh, and put it in the back of their car because that won't happen. But it's more of a, an experience for that customer to actually come in and experience their products uh, and have that conversation with their, the sales associate, the store associate, who's fully empowered um, to have a, a meaningful conversation back about their product. Um, there's a couple of stores at the moment. I think they're, they're looking to actually push this out to about 100 stores. They're looking to expand over the next two years with that exact same concept. And if you look into the middle picture here, that's their till. That's their till point. So as you can see, it's completely clean. There's nothing on it. There's no, there's no, there's no iPad. There's no cash drawer. There's no printer. It's all actually hidden away in this drawer. And as you can see, uh, you know, they've got the ability to then walk around the store with that iPad, uh, with the payment device, uh, and give that customized, personalized experience to the consumer. And they can do that anywhere in the store. So very much following that, if anyone's been into an Apple store, you can actually purchase where you stand. You don't have to go to a till point and queue up. You can have that intimate conversation with that store associate. Um, and just following on from this, I suppose if, if you're then changing that store look and feel uh, and you're changing the way your consumers then interact with you in store, um, one thing that, that has been talked about and is, is in existence um, is this idea of beacons and what beacons can do for a business. The, the stat is that, that during this year there's going to be a million beacons in the US deployed. Um, and unfortunately, I, I, know, I know the technology. I've, I know what it can do for a business, but I haven't seen that. Um, I haven't seen that actually. I haven't seen beacons being used or, or interacting with me as a consumer in a physical environment. So, quick show of hands: then, any retailers actually using beacons in their in their store? No, which is which is really really strange because this is a fantastic bit of kit that can really help you um, in your business. And I've got a quick video here about um, IKEA and what IKEA are doing with, with beacons in their retail stores. IKEA has been working with apps, web planning tools, augmented reality and other forward-looking concepts for many years. The latest innovation are beacons, small Bluetooth transmitters that are located in certain places around the furniture stores, enabling direct communication with IKEA shoppers. Beacons send useful messages to compatible smart devices when they are within proximity of specific places. The requirement for the device is that the IKEA Family app has been installed and Bluetooth turned on. Beacon technology works with the new Bluetooth standard 4.0, which is used in iPhones with iOS 7.0 and Android with version OS 4.3 and later. This makes it possible to provide customers with relevant and interesting additional information on the spot. So, as you can see, um, they're, they're taking full advantage of uh, beacon technology in store um, to very much give a, a again a, a digital personalized experience to that consumer depending on where they are within that store and you can actually um, you can actually take that one step forward actually um, and uh, with the iPad you, you can actually use the iPad and, and make the iPad act as a beacon itself uh, and with that you can then actually interact even greater with the app uh, and pull even further information about that consumer back into the pulse. So for example, we've got um, customers where if a customer walks into store, then the app recognizes that they've walked into store um, and will populate that order or with, that, with that customer uh, and actually show that store associate that that customer is in the store. Um, and similarly, if that customer has actually added product to their basket on the app, that will be transferred into the, into the point of sale um, till so that the store associate knows that that customer is actually looking at these products. So it can be very powerful as a, as a tool to actually give a more personalized experience to the consumer. 
Um, and, and obviously with that, you know, you can drive app usage outside of the store as well. If you've got that in-store engagement with that consumer, you can then drive additional uptake um, of the app outside of store, um, which leads me on to the, the next point about um, app strategies. And I pulled this stat from App Annie, um, uh, which is a great source for, for anything app related. And they, they reckon that by 2021, um, app commerce will be worth in the region of, of six trillion, which is phenomenal, right? Um, if you think where we are now, I mean, which retailers at the moment don't have an app? That's good. Is that one? One. Um, that is fantastic. So you all have that app strategy, whether it be a, a native app or whether it be a um, PWA. Um, uh, but but it needs to be it needs to be high on your agenda. You know, what are you going to do with that? How are you going to interact this with the POS, with your online space, and bring that all together? Here's a great example of um, an app that's been uh, pushed out by a company called POC, um, who I think, I believe, have made the made.com app as well. Um, who's familiar with uh, Tinder? No, let me rephrase that. Who's familiar? Who's, who will freely admit to knowing about Tinder? <laughs> So Tinder is for a, well, I'd say it's for a specific age range, right? And, and the same with Misguided. They're, they're very much focused on a particular age range of consumers. Uh, and what they decided to do is actually marry the two together. Um, you've got your Tinder app, swipe right, I believe, so I'm told. If you like, and swipe left if you don't. And it's very similar with the Misguided app. If you love the product, you swipe right. If you don't like it, you swipe left. Um, so Pop developed this. Uh, they called it Swipe to Hype, which is a great name. Um, they only launched it last year, but it literally went from zero to a 30 million revenue run rate in three months. It speaks for itself, right? The app strategy needs to be there as a retailer, and you can think around that. How can you then engage that with your other parts of your business? Order management. Um, I, this is something that... Um, is, is fairly new in terms of technology, really. I mean, everyone talks about ERP systems underpinning the, the fundamentals of a business. Um, and order management is something that's really been, um, it's always been there, but it's, it's never really been marketed as a, um, a must have, which it, I, I feel it is now. Uh, and if you think that the capabilities of what uh, order management can do for a business, they're taking the inventory and they're making all the inventory across all the channels of your business available to that consumer. So regardless of where that consumer is or where they're shopping, that product is available to them to order. And I think that's key um, for, for repeat business as well. If that customer knows they can get that product from you, then they'll continue to get it. If they're shopping online and they find that it's out of stock online because the distribution center's out of stock, then they're going to go somewhere else. But if they go online and they find out, actually, I can go and pick it up from my local store because my local store has got it, order management can do that. Order management can also enhance the store to actually pick and pack and ship that product from store as well. And, and if you think that that itself um, changes the dynamics of the in-store associate at the same time, you know, that consumer can actually get that product quicker because that store might be closer to where that consumer lives and that shipping cost is going to be much reduced as well. Um, and the power of this can actually increase store um, revenues because if you think about the click and collect aspect of any business, which is, which is key and fundamental, um, you know, you're going to have stores which are um, I, I suppose get higher traffic than other stores in your portfolio. But, but typically, if you have a click and collect functionality on your website, you've got the ability then to divert that customer to a, a low footfall store, which in turn, you know, and, and the statistic is that if you offer click and collect, when that customer goes in, they typically then go and buy something else. So you've got the ability then to increase the store revenues from a store that's not doing so well to a store that is, is you know, getting high footfall and high revenues. So it's definitely something to, um, to consider. Um, I can't really stand here with my background in payments and, and not talk about payments. And um, my, my exposure to, to Visa um, puts me in good stead because I understand from the, from the Polish market that there's been a bit of an explosion in um, 
uh, cards being issued in this market. And I think since 2013, I think the, the card issuance has more than doubled uh, in that year. And I think that's, that's pretty much been down to the acceptance of uh, contactless as a payment type. Um, and as a result, the ability to then create an omni-channel payment solution um, is also a critical factor to consider when deploying an omni-channel solution. Um, the, the card schemes would, would have you think that um, the Visa and MasterCards of the world would have you think that tokenization is, is a brand new thing that they invented. Um, but in actual fact, um, tokenization has been, been around since actually when I, when I first started in payments in 2003. And it's never really been marketed as a, as a, as a product to, to take to market. But um, uh, and, uh, just for, for your background, actually, tokenization from the card schemes was only really uh, invented from their perspective to support Apple Pay expansion uh, across uh, the US and, and Europe. But having that omnichannel token uh, stored for that consumer allows for a better frictionless payment experience going forward. So, for example, if a consumer shops in store, uh, on a face-to-face -face device, on a chip and pin terminal, contactless terminal, the payment gateway could facilitate the tokenization of that card, which you can then store against that uh, consumer's account. So when they come to use another channel, online or mobile, that card is already stored. So all you need to do is then take them through that 3D secure or CV2 re-entry to get a fully authenticated uh, transaction processed. There is a challenge going the other way. Um, the, the challenge being is that if that consumer shops online, you can tokenize the card. There's very little you can do with that tokenized card detail in store. Um, and that all comes down to the card scheme rules and, and tokenization in regards to authentication. So when a consumer goes in store, the card scheme rules state that you've got to authenticate them in, a, in an in-store fashion, that being chip and pin or contactless. Um, uh, and that's a barrier. And I think the, the card schemes are slowly waking up to this. They're a bit like oil tankers trying to, um, trying to get them to, to shift their focus. But when they do focus on it and when they do want something to happen, they do make it happen. For example, they are, um, they are championing the, the idea of uh, pin on glass, which is um, removal of the huge Verifone terminals in replacement of a small contactless device, which then you could use actually the, the tablet screen to enter your pin. Um, there's always going to be security concerns from a consumer point of view, putting your pin into someone else's device, but that's something that the, the Visa and MasterCards of the world are going to overcome through their, their marketing tactics. Um, and I, what was the other thing I was going to say on payments? Um, yeah, so, so they actually, uh, that's what I was going to say. So um, when, when we come to actually tokenizing online to use in store, uh, I've been into the Visa Innovation Centre in, in Paddington in London, and they've got a till set up where they've got a, a fingerprint device authentication uh, solution. Uh, now, that would be fantastic from, from that point of view and a frictionless, frictionless in-store commerce payment experience, but that device in itself costs about £10,000. So um, whether that's going to catch on and, and go viral, I don't, I don't think so. It's going to happen in the, in the next sort of uh, five, ten years, in my opinion. Um, so just to, just to uh, conclude, really, um, I, I suppose from a, from a Magento point of view, Magento's in a fantastic position that it's got a, a huge community of agencies, system integrators, and, and technology partners such as ourselves that allow you to get to a, what we call an omni-channel perspective. From a retailer, you know, you're probably in that, uh, I, I suppose, multi-channel view, looking to get into the... Um, the aspirational omni-channel uh, position um, and we, we, we actually pitched uh, a complete Magento omni-channel solution um, to Visa actually, we're in the Visa building and one of the, one of the Visa employees is an ex-Argos system um, uh, architect uh, and Argos is a, is a huge um, retailer in the UK uh, and they've spent many years trying to get their omni-channel strategy correct. Uh, and this guy actually said to me, um, he said, we've, we've tried many years and we've spent millions of pounds and he, he, he muted 15 million pounds trying to get to this aspirational omni-channel position. And what I showed him was a solution where actually he could get to at a fraction of that cost. So 
I'll leave that with you. Um, lots to think about in terms of the in-store retail and bringing that uh, online uh, and bringing all those channels together to give this unified commerce nirvana uh, position. Thank you very much.